All right, guys, I, I'm sorry that you have to watch the video again, um, but I realized when I started going on with the seniors uh, in class that uh, there's a couple things that I always draw on the board that are really critical to understand these notes, so that wouldn't have come across in just audio, so I went ahead and made a video. So moving forward, we're going to talk more about behavior, um, and ultimately all we're saying here is that organisms are going to have certain ways that they act and they behave, and those are also going to have an effect on their survival, right? So natural selection should work on the level of behaviors and help us explain why animals or, or any organism does the things that it does. So let's look at some examples. Okay, so we're going to start out with guppies. Uh, we mentioned guppies earlier in the notes in terms of natural selection, determining their different traits. But we also want to consider why a guppy chooses to mate with another guppy, okay? And so this behavior has been observed, and generally these fish, along with other fish too, will choose the um, brightest colored fish to mate with. So in other words, being brightly colored is, is the sexiest fish. And we know this through observations that show that the, the brightest fish are the ones who most successfully find a mate. Now, what we also know from observation is that usually the brightest fish are the healthiest fish, right? They live the longest, they're the most alert and agile in the water, so it makes sense, right? Bright color appears to be an indicator of good health, and so you want to mate with a fish that is healthy. Now, Dr. Dugotkin at U of L um, has been studying for many years, now maybe 20 years, guppies in his laboratory. And what he is studying is uh, his own hypothesis that in guppies, there's actually an even stronger reason that they choose the mate they choose. And what Dugatkin suggests is that guppies, like a lot of other organisms and maybe even humans, perform mate copying, where females in particular choose to mate with males who they see with other females. So it's almost as though they care what the other female fish think. Um, he suggested this is stronger than even the coloration of the male fish in terms of choosing a mate. And so you can kind of think of this like um, in humans, it's, it's kind of a stereotype, but there's that idea that once a, a, a person is taken, right, once a guy has a, is, is married or, or has a girlfriend, then they become more attractive, right? Then you can't have them anymore, so then you, you want them or whatever. And, you know, the basis behind that concept, if it is true, is that you know, if somebody gets married, it means they're a valuable partner, right? They bring something to that marriage, and you can make that assumption that if this guy gets married, then the girl he married uh, uh, knows that he can provide for her, or he's just a good husband, or whatever it might be. So you have reason to then think, okay, this guy is a respectable guy, so I should like him because he is married. So this concept is brought to the level of these fish. Now, here's what Dugatkin does, okay? He has a lab in the basement of uh, the Life Science Building at UofL. And in that lab, he's got uh, aquariums, floor to ceiling, all over the place. But he's got special aquariums, kind of like this one I'm going to start drawing here, that ha have these um, clear walls in them so that he can separate it. So essentially, he's going to have an aquarium that he can break into three different areas. Now here's what he's going to do. In the middle, he's going to put a female fish. Right, so we give her a little, little bow on her head here. Um, and we'll call this female uh, Judy. All right, so he's going to put Judy in this middle tank. Then he's going to put a male fish on either side. So over here, he's going to put a male fish. Give him a little bow tie. All right, we'll call him. Uh, we'll call him Steve. All right, and then on the other side, he's also going to put a uh, a male fish, and we'll call. Let's give him a bow tie, and we'll call him Pat. All right, it's a good name. Now you're going to try to make these two male fish as alike as possible, right? Because we're going to try to control this experiment. So we want two males that look very, very similar. Then here's what we do. We put a second female 
over here with Pat. Alright, and uh, we'll call her um, Gladys. Alright, and then we just kind of let them hang out. We put Gladys on this side with Pat. We got Judy in the middle. We got Steve on the left. Now remember, these little walls here are just like clear glass. So they can see each other, but they can't get to each other. Then what they will do is they will remove Gladys from the tank. And they will remove these partitions from the tank. And 85% of the time... Judy will choose to mate with Pat. Now, what this kind of indicates is that Judy is interested in the fact that some other female fish is interested in Pat, right? Maybe there's something about that fish, that male fish that she can't just see. So the fact that he's hanging around another female is a good thing. So 85% of the time. Now, here's where it gets cool. Dugakin is trying to prove that this is stronger than the coloration patterns, so, here's what he does in the next version of his experiment. He sets it up pretty much the same way, except now we make Steve the really sexy, ornate kind. So this is now sexy Steve, right? The sexy, ornate kind of fish. And we make Pat the really ugly, no one wants to mate with that thing fish, right? So. He's all messed up. He's got spots all over him, and he's just ugly. Okay, so Pat, ugly. Steve, sexy. Now, you do the same experiment otherwise. So you add another female, you leave it some time, then you remove the walls, and still, almost 85% of the time, Judy chooses Pat, even though he's the ugly one, and Steve is the sexy one. So what this experiment shows us is that Guppies do tend to make copy, and it probably is a stronger behavior than choosing uh, you know, the fancy coloration and stuff. Okay, now, this is not so much behavioral, but this is just a structural thing that I wanted to bring up. You know, in the first part of the notes, I mentioned Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, and I said that, that he wrote that humans were not fully adapted to bipedalism just yet. And what I wanted to point out to you is that we do have structural evolution in humans uh, that seems to support the idea that we should walk on two feet. And one of those major structural adaptations I might have mentioned earlier this year, and that is that we are the only organism that primarily walks on two feet and has a locking mechanism in our knee. So that when you straighten your leg all the way out, your knee will actually lock into place and what this does is it allows you to put all your weight on a, on a column of bone versus having to use your muscles to hold yourself up. So do a little experiment real quick, okay? I want you to stand up, and I want you to notice that you can put your weight on one foot or the other, and it's not hard, right, to do that. Um, it's because you've got that leg locked. Now what I want you to do is to stand up but keep both of your knees bent, almost like you're, you're crouching or something. Now, that's going to start to burn after a minute, right? I think you should stand that way for the rest of this video. But, you know, that's going to start to burn, and that's because you're having to use those leg muscles to keep yourself up. Now, here's the really fun part that we did in class and you missed out on. Go ahead and stand up, both your knees bent, and try to walk around without locking either knee, without extending either leg all the way. It's a little bit hard. It'll start to burn, and you're going to kind of look like a monkey walking around. Right? If you keep your knees bent and you don't straighten them, that's going to wear you out to the point that you would eventually give up, use your forelimbs or your hands to help you move around, or maybe just sit down. And this is the major difference between us and then chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas. Their knees don't lock. So while they can walk on two feet for a few minutes, it really wears them out, and they've tended to, to resort to using their forelimbs um, to help them around. Us, we lock our leg intermittently. Every step we take, we extend the leg and lock it, and that takes that weight off of those muscles for a minute and allows you to stay standing a whole lot longer. Now, the last thing we want to get into and then carry over into our next class is uh, uh, taking a look at human behavior. Evolutionary psychologists are kind of a new group of scientists who study the evolution of a human behavior. 
And these guys uh, suggest a lot of kind of crazy ideas um, because they say that every behavior you see in humans still exists today because for some reason or another it was selected for. It helped you survive. Now, a little bit of this is kind of controversial, um, like it says here. Uh, so I want you to realize that what we're talking about over these next couple class days isn't necessarily right or good, okay? But when you look at it from a natural selection point of view, it makes sense. So here's the first one, the one that we're going to look at in this video. Homicide. Murder. Killing someone. All right? Some have argued that murder is actually encouraged by natural selection. Seems kind of crazy, right? In today's society, there are laws against killing people. It's not right to kill people, right? The social structure that we have tells us that you shouldn't kill each other. And while I agree with this, right, it would be a bad place if you could just kill people when you wanted to, it doesn't make the most sense based on natural selection. Because remember, your survival is what is paramount here, is what is most important. So your willingness to kill someone else will probably help you survive. And if you're not willing to kill someone else, you might get killed. And this is what evolutionary psychologists say, is that being willing to commit murder might be a positive behavioral trait based on natural selection. So they studied some inmates, some guys on death row, convicted of murder, and they found some tendencies in their characteristics. Right? They tended to have extreme aggression, they tended to have increased territoriality, so they, have, they really take care of their stuff, and increase coalition formation, so they take care of others that they care about. I mean, think about that. The aggression might not be a positive at all times, but, but taking care of your stuff and people that you care about, those are good traits, right? So these character traits in these people potentially played a role in them killing someone. But think about what would this would mean if we went way back in the past, when humans did exist, but there, there wasn't a series of laws. At that point, you needed to protect your family and yourself. And you may have had to do that by killing someone. So at that point, it was a good behavior to have, and maybe we just haven't evolved far enough yet to where we haven't gotten rid of murder. Now, one thing I want to make sure you realize that, that I realize is for most homicide that occurs today, people have psychological issues. Right? There's a psychological break that has taken place. Um, in a lot of cases, a diagnosable disorder or some sort of chemical involved like drugs and alcohol. So we're not going to say that homicide is good and that homicide is something that's really thought through very much. But maybe the instinctual, um, I hate to say urge, but the instinctual um, process of maybe killing someone and being willing to do that is something that would have helped you survive at some point in history. Now, those who were against this idea, and still are against this idea, this notion that, that maybe evolution tells us to kill people, argued with mainly this first point, which you may have heard before, and that's that people are more commonly killed by someone they know, and this is especially true that people are more often killed by relatives than anyone else. And while that's true in, in some ways, right, I mean, your suspect pool is usually not a bunch of strangers, they're people that knew you. Um, these people were, were bent on finding some data that would support that um, there's no way that evolution would lead you to kill someone. Um, because if you kill your relatives, or if you kill your family, that's the opposite of kin selection like we saw in class, right? This is the opposite of altruism. Um, you're getting rid of people who share your genes, and that doesn't really make sense. Now, the evidence that these people tried to cite was a few years ago when this came out was evidence from Detroit, Michigan, in 1972. Now, I realize that's one city, and that's a long time ago. But they looked at that data, and they saw that 25% of closed murder cases involve relatives, according to police reports. That's a lot. Like, I know out of, out of 100%, 25% seems kind of low, but that's a lot of kin killing. So this would seem to show you, hey, there's no sense in this based on natural selection if you're killing your relatives. But what do you think? What do you think's wrong with this data? Um if we really break it down more. It has to do with this right here. What's wrong with this data is that the police definition of relative is not the biological definition of relative, right? Who's most likely to kill each other? Husbands and wives. 
right? And you would know this if you were married at this point. But spouses, right? So spouses are not genetically related to each other. That doesn't fit into kin selection ideas. Nor are stepchildren or stepparents. So if we take that same Detroit data and we remove the spouse killings and the stepchild or stepparent killings, now only 6% of the murders were killing kin or killing genetic relatives. That's a really small amount. And natural selection is not always going to be followed, right? It's based on averages. So it seems like if 94% of murders are not your relatives, there's no reason why we can't say that evolution and natural selection might tend you toward homicidal tendencies. So there's a question in your homework that asks you if the Detroit data supported this idea or not. You know, technically, the Detroit data was supposed to rule against homicide being a naturally selected trait, but it really doesn't because of this problem with the way we define relatives. Okay, last thing. The last thing about homicide is that uh, researchers also suggested that people who are related would be more likely to help each other murder someone versus actually kill each other. And this is also supported by data from several different um, um, select uh, cities and, and um, dates and things. So you're more likely to help your brother kill somebody than you are to kill your brother. But suggestion has also been that you are going to see the most kin killing, or you're going to see the most killing of siblings or, or parents or kids if it comes down to requiring resources. So ultimately, your survival is most important. And if that would require you to kill your brother, that might be a reason to kill your brother. Now, this is, is based on historical findings, things that have been written, whatever, not true statistics. But the idea is you saw the most killing of actual blood relatives in primogenitor societies when there were kings and queens and that kind of deal, right? In those societies, the oldest male in the family is going to inherit everything from the parents, and other siblings will get nothing. That means any kind of sister, older or younger, gets nothing, and younger brothers get nothing. Now, at that time, it made sense to kill your older brother, right? So this is me. This is my older but smaller brother. I would help him rather than hurt him in most situations. But if I was in a situation where I would get no resources at all because he's the older brother, then it makes sense for me to kill him. And so in those societies, we probably did see kin killing a lot more than we ever see anywhere else. Okay, so this gets you all caught up, and we'll move from here next class um, and talk about some more things that I think get even more interesting.